Hi, welcome to valuationpodcast.com, a podcast and video series about all things related to business and valuation. My name is Melissa Gregg, and I'm a valuation expert and divorce mediator in St. Louis, Missouri. Today, we will discuss how to find hidden assets and or understated income in divorce cases with Leah Wheat Holter, a forensic accountant, certified fraud examiner, and private investigator in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Welcome, Leah. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. You have an amazing background, but let's get right into it because this is a very interesting topic um, involving mistrust, money, and love, or better known as divorce. So both of you, play, both of us play in this space a lot. Um, so I think it's going to be a fun conversation, but I just want to get some of our viewers up to speed. And so can you just help us, you know, how would you describe what you do as a forensic accountant in a divorce case? Yeah. So, um, I typically, there's four areas. So I typically help people find hidden assets. And then I also, like you mentioned in your intro, that we also help determining if like all of the income has been uh, reported as part of this marital estate. And I'll kind of talk about each of these. But then also we help kind of prepare ahead of time evaluation. We don't do valuations. So we help prepare ahead of time uh, valuation experts, especially when there's like a family owned or closely held business. We kind of find some, you know, fun things in there. Uh, and then sometimes when there are prenup agreements or inheritance funds, we trace those funds to see whether they should be included or not included in a marital estate. So to kind of, I guess, dive down into each of those. The first thing is, a lot of the times our clients want to know like what exists in the marital estate. And typically we're helping the out spouse. So the person who didn't control the finances within their marriage. And um, so typically we're looking at data from the last three to five years of their marriage. And they just want to know when we go in, into a property settlement, um, is everything that's listed here, is that really what we're going to divide? Or are there things that I don't know about? Um, and so we help them kind of go through, we go through their financial information to find those things and help them kind of bring some peace of mind to that area. And the way we do it is a little differently. Um, so I have a degree in accounting. I have this background in accounting. I have always wanted, I, I mean, I started this career and stumbled into accounting because I wanted to be an FBI agent. So I worked for the FBI for a couple of years in undergrad and grad school. And so I learned to work investigations based on just using bank statement and credit card statement information and converting that into Excel and then using that information to kind of see what happened and to be able to tell that story of where did money come from and where did it go? Well, that same process, and, and we've really, you know, we've taken that process and we use technology in my practice to do something that we call data sleuthing, which is essentially this forensic accounting techniques and procedures supercharged with data analytics. So we're not necessarily looking to see, uh, you know, we're not necessarily talking about like big unstructured data and data analytics um, from trying to detect certain things. We're actually using data analytics and data and primarily structured data to say what happened. So, um, so we've trademarked this phrase data sleuth to be forensic accounting plus data analytics to perform an investigation. And um, by identifying where did money come from and where did it go based on your bank statements, credit card statements, pay stubs, maybe some tax returns, there's different data sources we can pull from. We typically uncover hidden assets. So I have owned Workman Forensics for the last 10 years. And in 10 years, and I think I've worked somewhere around 200 cases, not all of divorce, but um, in all of these cases, if it has been a divorce case, I think there's only been one case where we didn't identify something hidden or unknown. And I do like to say that I don't really think that there is such a thing as a hidden asset. It's just that usually our clients don't know where to even start looking. So to them, it feels hidden. But when you know where to look and how to look, you know, we can usually uncover that. So just like we would do that in a personal, like by looking at what are all of these personal things that you own, sometimes our clients, their spouses, or even themselves, they work in this family owned or closely held business. And in doing that, um, you know, if you think about it, 
you're running this family owned, closely held business, and you know that whatever's reported as income on at the end of the year, you're going to pay taxes on. So there's like this built in incentive in just running a small business where you're going to take advantage of certain rules and uh, just tax benefits to reduce your tax liability, right? And different structuring of companies and changing your year end, having different year ends and all these things to defer some of that revenue. Well, or recognizing that revenue for tax purposes. So in doing that, um, that might be beneficial for the family when everyone's together. But when you go into a divorce situation, that's making uh, you know, that really works in the favor of the person who's been controlling the finances of the family and not necessarily the person who or the out spouse. And so we will often go in and look at, OK, what are the benefits that the owner has been taking that while it might be fine for tax, we're not weighing in on whether it's allowable or not, but just what are the things that whenever it's time to value this business, these things should have been considered a benefit to the owner and could impact uh, that outcome. And I've got a good story later in the um, interview about that. So we help with that. And then sometimes when there's a prenup agreement or inheritance funds, that can actually make it where even though funds were all maybe in the same account, that really some of these uh, funds can be separated. So maybe um like one time somebody had some inheritance money and the wife, the husband did, and the wife didn't understand that inheritance money was his. And at least in the state of Oklahoma, that made it where what he used those funds on were hit was his when it came time to separate the assets. And so uh, sometimes we just trace those types of funds to be able to say, no, actually this is his separate property or her separate property. And we do that with prenup agreements as well. And then lastly, we perform lifestyle analysis uh, procedures to determine uh, if income has been understated, which is important, especially with alimony. And, and mainly for us, we do it in child support cases. Well, and I think what people don't understand, because <clears throat> valuations involve the balance sheet and income statement of a business, but a lot of times that could be reported on Schedule C on their personal tax return. And so I think that people don't conceptually understand that a lot of what we're doing in the business valuation is sanity checking it. Like, does this make sense? Does the tax return add up? Because a lot of times the spouse that maybe has been kept away from the finances comes to you and says, <clears throat> you know, there was a lot, you know, like we used to have 30, 40, $50,000 coming into our account a month. And now my, my spouse is saying that we only make $30,000 a year. Yeah. And those are like that you, somebody will come in and say that to you. And then what do you do? Because you do things a little bit different. And I think that this is kind of interesting. Um, but you will help educate those people. So talk us through. I come in and I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Like we always had money. We had fancy cars. We had fancy houses. Like, but now he's saying we don't make anything. You know, right. what, what do you do from that point? Yeah. So we immediately just recommend that. And, and we actually do this for them if they want us to, but we just start going through their bank statements and their credit card statements. That is the first place that we start. If they're an employee of a company, then we ask for those pay stubs as well, but just get started there. Um, and then by just simply, uh, you know, we've automated a lot of this process, but by creating something that we call a source in use, we start with where did the deposits come from? Do we identify any bank accounts that money's coming from that we didn't know about? Uh, you know, we have these three bank accounts, but there's money being transferred from a fourth bank account. Well, what's this fourth bank account? So then we, you know, get with their attorney and then usually discovery request or subpoena to get that information. Um, but this, but then, you know, on the expenditure side, how the funds were used, we look for wires, we look for payments to other LLCs. Then we might, we might then do the research on the LLC to see who owns this and uh, which could lead just to another, you know, just open another can of worms. 
But then with this same information, we can create a lifestyle analysis to look at how much is being spent on rent. And really a lot of this work is just done over kind of like a pivot table. So who's being paid monthly and doing a count or a sum of how many payments are going to this vendor every month and how much money. And, you know, you can uncover, well, like, why are we paying? Like we might have a lake house in our personal home, but why are we paying a third utility bill? Um, why are we paying for an apartment when we already have two homes? Those types of things. Um, so that's how we kind of use all of this data to then help tell the story. And then whenever you add in just knowing what to look for on a tax return, and then I, I am a private investigator. And so we have access to some databases. It's all public source information, but these databases do pull this public source information into one spot so that I can see, you know, okay, well, we searched the Oklahoma Secretary of State for LLCs associated with the spouse, but maybe they wanted to start something else. And so they went and they registered in Delaware. So, or some other state and, or maybe uh, especially around here, like maybe Arkansas or Texas. And so that, that helps us kind of create that whole um, picture. Yeah. And I think that, you know, in divorce, emotions and suspicions are high, you know, so anytime somebody's going through divorce, they're just going to be suspicious of their spouse in general. And what I kind of come in to a lot of times, because we do similar work, is I come in and say, I know that your spouse is really smart and crafty and gets over on a lot of people, but there's always ways to trace money unless you're, unless, you know, they're coming in with cash through the business and then it's just, yes, there, there are obviously ways that we could lose the trail, but for the most part, they are not trying to trick you, right? They've just been doing what they've been doing. But in those types of situations, I think that sometimes people want, you know, they're like, well, I really need to investigate. Like, I don't know what they're doing. Maybe they're spending money on another person, you know, but, but in this context, why would somebody really need to come in and hire you as a private investigator if they were getting divorced? Or is that just kind of one area that supports the whole picture? Yeah. So in a divorce case, the things I mentioned, those four, four areas, that those are our specialties. That's what we're really great at. If you need to identify, you know, uncover hidden money, understated income, things that deal with dollars, we're really great at that. Uh, we are private investigators as well. So we do have access, like I said, to um, databases and so forth that help us get additional information. Also, we do training on open source intelligence or OSINT. To, um, and so we follow a lot of those people to kind of see how can we uh, leverage social media and other open sources of information on the internet to kind of answer a lot of these questions. But I would say that uh, we partner with other private investigators when it gets to the level of maybe needing to do some interviews or go ask some questions at an apartment complex or um, even surveillance. Like, what is this guy? You know, this guy says he has a lawn mowing business, but like, what is he really doing to pay these bills? Because this isn't adding up. Uh, so that's where a lot of times we'll use the resources of a private investigator. And that's, I think that's just, you know, what traditionally people think of like a stakeout and we're going to have a private investigator, we're going to find out. But the reality is we get a lot of information from actual documents, actual yep. statements, and we're looking not necessarily what somebody tells us, but what we can see. Mm -hmm. um, and in that respect, though, you are working with the actual people right? Which I think that this is a little different. Um, how do you help a couple? And it's usually just one party, but how do you help people get prepared to get divorced through, you have a course and a notebook, find money and divorce? Because I think this is a really important piece of it. So can you t walk us through? It's not just you, it's you're educating the person getting divorced, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, Several of our older YouTube videos kind of on our YouTube channel talk more about 
this course in general and all the different modules. And we've kind of scaled that back recently because I think it's a little overwhelming when you've been the uh, out spouse and you don't really know where to start. So what we did was we scaled that back. And so now what we offer is a course and a workbook that's just called Get Organized in Your Divorce. If and we have a, a checklist and all this stuff. Like if you can just walk through the course that we have, the online course that we have, and you can do it at your own pace at any time, it doesn't have to be live or anything. And this workbook, then the things you need to be, to look at, you can get started. And then you have some information to then, and, and we even have, um, like spreadsheets and ways to organize the information so that you can then go talk to your attorney and say, Hey, you know, I was, I'm organizing this information and I see that I'm missing this chunk of documents or, Hey, like, I know we had this bank account for these years and we have this bank account for these years, but I've got a gap. So just by organizing it in this way that we have found helpful, we're sharing our tools with, you know, our clients or potential clients to say, just start here, just get organized. So we, have created other modules to kind of help them walk through and review their own bank statements and stuff. But like I said, it was a little overwhelming. So we've scaled that back. But what's nice about creating that process is we can empower our potential clients or anyone who just wants to get organized, do this first, work with your attorney, and then it makes working with us much more efficient because we do have this really nice process where the majority of this is automated. And so we can actually import and analyze and provide a lifestyle analysis uh, very efficiently for these clients that have, you know, gone ahead and gotten organized at the beginning. Because a lot of time, I don't know about your cases, but a lot of our time in our cases, the case management, before we've even digitized anything or analyzed a single record, is un it is unbelievable how many hours that is. And so by doing this first, that just kind of helps keep the cost down for um, any potential clients. Well, and we have, you know, we have a few cases right now where, you know, there's been a lot of accounts opened and closed. And so there's like, well, um, it went in and out or money goes in and out and it's duplicated, you know, like we're really just trying to get the clear picture. And I think that sometimes spouses know how to muddy the trail, but they don't necessarily know how to erase it, you know, so we're still, but it's time consuming. And that's, where I think it gets to be difficult because I will give suggestions to clients all the time, like start going through your bank statement and look for round numbers, you know, like look for big transfers out, look for accounts that you don't recognize. We saw, we just were reviewing something this morning and I talked to the attorney. I was like, so I'm seeing a lot of payments to an Amex, but I don't see an Amex in the discovery, you know, like I don't see that we were provided with that information. And they're like, oh yeah, you know. So walk us through some of that. Like what are some pieces of advice that you might just to get started um, that they could just start considering? Yeah, so um, I will actually provide to you so that you can anybody who wants to download it can. We actually have a checklist from the workbook where people can just start gathering this information. And it's fairly specific. About, um, you know, look at the last three to five years. We get cases a lot, especially if it's been a 25, 30 year marriage. And they say, well, I had this account from 1990. And then this, and it's like, okay, okay. Like I get it. And that might've happened back then, but we can't get bank records back then. So anyway, so I, I can provide this checklist but just a very simple checklist to start with bank statements, credit card statements, pay stubs if the spouse is employed, um, whether employed by, you know, by themselves or uh, someone else. And then tax returns, any known business names, credit reports. If you can have credit reports run on you and your spouse before any divorce has been filed or anything like that, that's really helpful because we do not recommend that you run a credit report on your spouse after you filed the, I mean, without their knowledge anytime, right? Like that's supposed to be disclosed, but um, that's just a really good place to get started and to also run credit reports on your children. Mm -hmm. it's not uncommon that sometimes if the spouse has gotten in trouble, trying to hide uh, an affair will open cards in a child's name and then start running expenses that way. So uh, that's where we start. And as part of our 
process, like I said, looking at where did money come from and where did it go? If someone has, you know, gotten organized and then asks us like, hey, can you digitize and just tell me what's in this information? One of the things that our automated macro does is identify those things that you mentioned and kind of lump them all together. Okay, here's all the even dollar payments. Here's all of these payments to anything that ends in LLC or Inc. Here's all of the payments that went to individuals um, so that it kind of organizes it so that somebody can look through and go, oh, you know, I know Bob, but why did $50,000 go to Steve? You know, and start asking questions like that. Well, and I know a lot of banks, <clears throat> you can go on and get, you know, like your last 18 months of statements downloaded into Excel. Mm -hmm. um, do they really need to get everything in Excel or can they give you like PDF documents or online documents? Because you're talking about a lot of fancy analysis, um, you know, that people might not understand. So that, do they have to give it the documents to you in a certain way? Um, so we have tools where we can pull it from PDF. Obviously, if you've downloaded your bank statements to PDF from the website and not like printed them off and scanned them five times, like so that we get like the fifth version of a copy, um, then our the software we use will import that fairly quickly cleanly. Um, and then of course, any Excel downloads you can get from your bank that just gives you like, that's just less time involved for sure on the processing end for us. But usually the um, Excel downloads, you know, they don't have, they haven't digitized who you wrote checks to. So a lot of that has to be done manually, but um, yeah, just any format. And then we can import this information and then run these reports. Okay. So if we're looking at hidden assets, because I think that that's what people always want to know, um, how do you find hidden assets and what could be an example? Because I think, you know, sometimes we're talking about things that we totally know. Um, but a lot of times, I mean, I did have a recent client that called and they're like, I know we own some businesses, but I don't know how many. I don't know what the names are, you know, and and I think we we chuckle, but it it really, you know, because we're like, well, how could you not know what's going on? But this is what's happening in divorce is mm -hmm. that people are not keeping everybody up to speed on what's happening. So what's an example of, of a way that you kind of try to figure out, is there something missing? Yeah, so um by the process that I've mentioned a couple of times, just where did money come from? Where did it go? And we like to say that our clients know their story, but we know data. And so we can tell you what looks weird. And one of the reports we put together is an interesting data findings report where we say, hey, did you know that this utility, my, going back to my previous example, did you know that this utilities, your utilities, you had four payments to utilities every month? Like, do you have that many meters where that would make sense? Like that, those types of things. So we put that together on this interesting data findings. And then we give that to the client because finding hidden assets is not magic. It's just knowing where to look. There's no secret database. And if there is a private investigator who's telling you, oh, I can look up your information on, you know, this database of bank accounts, you really need to be aware. Um, we at Workman Forensics, we do not use those types of databases. We can find the same information legally and um, financial information. The, the way I like to explain like kind of ethics in this space is what I want somebody doing that uh, with my information. So if you want to find something in my financial data, you can go through the courts and through the discovery process to find that information so that I know you're going to look. And then you start kind of creating this um, organized spider web, you know, tracing all of these clues out from the center. But what I don't want to have is someone is checking out my bank account information and I never even knew about it through mm -hmm. some, um, you know, I don't know, something sourced through dark web or something. I don't really understand how they're getting their information on those databases. So we don't use them. But uh, so a hidden asset, like I said earlier, yes, to the out spouse, it feels hidden to us. We just know where to go look. And so it's not magic, it's a process. So in looking at where did money come from, where did it go? And then providing that to the client and saying, okay, client, 
what on here looks weird to you? You know, from a data perspective, these are high risk, but it may be okay. There was one case where um, there was a hundred thousand dollars spent on at a jewelry store, and it was an even dollar payment too. And so, you know, I'm like, okay, spouse, like, are you familiar with this? And she says, oh yeah, that's such and such ring, and like she had it on. So it can be okay, but from a data perspective, that's like, oh my gosh, like, are we dealing like? this seems juicy, you know, and then we go talk to the client she's like, Oh no, here's the rings right here. So, um, a, one story that I have in mind whenever I'm thinking about people talking about hidden assets is there was this, uh, this professional and they were very familiar with how to set up companies and they were always, they're very entrepreneurial. And so they're always looking to set up different companies and different year ends and just, you know, oh, well, if we make tons of money here, we might want to defer income here. I mean, just, they were just always looking at these things and investments. And so the spouse had no clue. She had been raising kids and stuff. And then they decide they're going to get a divorce. The um, husband had time and this is what i'm always looking for like who filed and when did they file and when did the spouse notice that something in their behavior maybe started changing and stuff because that sometimes is an indicator that they could have started planning for divorce mm -hmm. well so we're looking at different things and it um i got involved really late in the case, which I hate because a lot of times if I had been involved in probably same for you, if we've been involved in the beginning, we can like help them. And there is so much emotion that I feel like a lot of times the out spouse is treated like the crazy spouse mm -hmm. and they're not crazy. There is a lot of truth in what they're saying, but they're so emotional because nobody's been listening because they're not the business person, you know, and, um, but they're usually not wrong, uh, right. or not a hundred percent wrong. Let's say that. So, she keeps saying, I know that he's hiding money. I know that other partners are probably holding money for him and all this stuff. And unfortunately, on that case, it was just too late in the game. The judge wasn't going to let me look at some information that would have helped with. I, I do think his receivables were going to a buddy of his. I don't I, I do think that still to this day, but I couldn't do anything about it. But when I looked at where did money go out of all these different bank accounts that they had, I you know, one of the things that stood out were these other related LLCs. So then that allowed us, the judge did allow us to look at the bank accounts of these related LLCs. One thing led to another. And we actually found where this guy had invested in a startup. And um, so whenever we're talking about that marital balance sheet and wanting to make sure that all the assets are on the balance sheet, sure, the balances of all these bank accounts are being listed. But this investment and this stock that he held in a startup, I mean, we're not talking about, you know, stock that's being reported and, you know, like uh, publicly traded stock. This was in a local startup. And so, you know, then we one of my recommendations was we either have to you either have to decide, you know, or agree to some sort of valuation and he gets to keep this or you need to have it valued or something. But to add that asset back you know, to the marital balance sheet. And that's what I would have considered a hidden asset in her case, because she didn't know that he had ever even made that investment. Yeah. And I think the, the hard part in divorce is that not always is everybody trying to hide things. They don't always know what's important. And we've found um, investment in startups just by looking at canceled checks, mm -hmm. you know, that a check was written for $10,000 to a certain company. And when we found out, oh, he does have ownership, he might have even forgot because a lot of times we have like kind of chronic entrepreneurs that they're invested in a lot of different areas. They're flying so fast and so high that they're not totally keeping track. But I think an important thing to reiterate that you said is that because we get calls all the time. They're like, okay, well, can you just access that database that tells us where everything is missing? And I'm like, well, that's not how this is working. Like we are looking at clues in the data. We're looking at clues in the bank statements. And I think that outspouse really has to just be kind of telling us as much as they can remember. Oh, I saw a statement once and it was 
to Wells Fargo or Bank of America, and we don't have any accounts at Bank of America. Or I saw this other mail had a different address on it, and I didn't think that we had that address. And so a lot of times that outspouse, just by giving you all of these different pieces of a puzzle that don't match in their head, when they combine it with what you have in data, it then brings the whole picture together, right? Yes. And I think that that's, it's not like we're flipping a switch, but that takes time, effort, and money Yeah. that not always, uh, you know, and sometimes it's not even the most cost effective. You know, if you're finding a hidden asset for 10 grand mm -hmm. and it costs you $30,000 to get there, that's not the best use of your time and effort. Mm -hmm. So, it, but it's hard to know that going into it, right? Right. Yep. Um, what about understated income? Why is this concept? Because I don't think people totally like we we briefly talked about it, but let's go a little bit deeper. Like, what is understated income? And it means something different in a business or personal. Mm -hmm. And why is it important in a divorce case? Sure. So I have two examples to kind of explain this. The first one is a personal example. There was, um, uh, there it was a it was actually in a child custody case, child support case. And so these individuals had never been married, but they have this child. And uh, the dad had said that he only made $17,000 a year and that he had this lawn mowing business. And, you know, he's like barely paying any child support. Well, the mom, obviously, and thanks to social media, I'm sure, notices how he's living. And, you know, now he's with some other lady who, and they have kids and, you know, all this stuff. And she's saying, I just don't think that they can go to private school if he is only making $17,000 a year. Like that's all his tax return showed. And so, you know, I'm thinking, okay, sure. We'll look at his, you know, we'll get his bank accounts. And I just wanted to help this lady. And um, so I'm thinking $17,000, like how complicated could this be? And so we don't typically do fixed fees on this type of case, but I'm like, oh yeah, we, we can do this. No problem. Um, I think there ended up being nine or 10 bank accounts for this guy and so many transactions, so many transactions. And so we um, just decided to run a lifestyle analysis and look at what was he spending money on every month? And really just from a cash basis, like he can say he only brings in X and that his net is 17, but let's look at these bank accounts and see how he's spending it. Uh, because in order to spend this cash, you have to be earning the cash. So we weren't looking at how much is he putting on a credit card? I don't care. I just want to know how much cash is he spending on a monthly or yearly basis? So we did this. I think we ended up doing this one by category. Um, just for some reason, I don't remember why. So we just kind of categorized, you know, rent, utilities, and various things. And my analyst at the time, she's running this analysis, and she said, Leah, I think, I think this guy is a weed dealer. And I was like, how do you know that? She said, well, you know, I looked him up on Facebook and just judging by how they spend their money, I just kind of get the feeling of like, this guy deals weed. I'm like, okay. Anyway, we end up uh, determining that his average income a year was not 17,000. And we're not talking about gross revenue. We're talking about what he's spending and not uh, business expenses. We were just focusing on personal living and he was spending between 75 and a hundred thousand dollars a year. So uh, his lawn business might have been really bad, but he had something else going on. So before the case ended up settling, so we didn't even have to go to court. But when we thought we were going to have to go to court, I asked the mom, our client, I said, by the way, this is really random. I just think my analyst would appreciate if I asked you, uh, is he, does he deal weed? And she goes, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, this might have been good to know ahead of yeah. time uh, that like his total income was not being driven by mowing yards, but um, and yeah. a cash basis type of situation, right? But I think the other thing is that you know it doesn't have to be an illegal thing because 
there's money that comes to you that you report on your um, income tax return. And then there's things like distributions that you'll see a K-1 that will say $13,000 was distributed to you, but that $13,000 doesn't show up on your tax return. And so, you know, sometimes I, I think part of our job is to really not get emotional and not get tied up in the story, but to really say, okay, let's assume that there's a real answer to this. You know, let, let's assume that there's probably a decent reason why this is happening. Um, what do the documents show us? Because that's a lot different than just being like, oh, he's screwing everybody over or, or whatever. But m maybe now I also need to start asking like, okay, so would they maybe be a drug dealer? Um, right. This would help. <laughs> I had never thought to ask this in, my, in this point of my career. And um, I mean, I'm still pretty surprised whenever I find out things, but, and you're right. We didn't care what he was doing to earn the income. I have no dog in that fight. Don't care. What I was hired to do was determine what is his actual income so that she, that her attorney can then uh, determine what child support she was owed. And we did that. And it just so happened that that's how he was. I mean, because lawn businesses are also a cash business. Yeah. So I fully expected, yeah, he's just not reporting everything. Right. But, and, yeah. and and you'll see that in restaurants. You'll see that in any place that there's some sort of cash coming in that may not hit the books, you know, and legitimately didn't hit the books. Um, but I think that what you're talking about, and we didn't really totally go into it, but a lifestyle analysis, you're looking at what pers a person is spending the money on if you can't always identify this missing cash, right? Right. So it's a little bit different. Another thing that I think is important, and you talked a little bit about it, is understanding the timeline of the divorce, not the filing, because that becomes important for litigation. Mm -hmm. But when did you start to think that something was off? You know, was it two years ago? Was it three years ago? Um, because for us, sometimes we need a clean year of reference point, right? So, yeah. if you, so if things started to get wonky three years ago, then we really want to go five years back because hopefully we'll see something normal way back when, and we'll have a reference point. Do you think that that's ever helpful, um, for what you guys are doing as well? Yes, for sure. Um, I had another case that uh, it was a doctor and he decided he was going to file for divorce. And all of a sudden his very lucrative practice was not making any money. And I don't really understand why this happened or, you know, I, I was kind of limited on what I had access to on that case. But unfortunately at the end, the judge kind of just said, too bad. Sounds like his business just declined and that, you know, he's making good money now where he is like, cause mm -hmm. he just, he tanked the business and it was very clear. And so, you know, in a case like that, I always want to get information on what were their receivables, like whenever they started thinking about divorce or even, you know, just when, and looking at that trend, like when did it just drop off and where did those go? And can we contact any of those people to see like, Hey, did somebody say, you know, where did you send these payments? But mm -hmm. that's how we like to approach these things. In that case, like I said, I can't quite remember why I couldn't get that information, but I kept asking for it and uh, it was just never granted, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And usually, I mean, in litigation, there's always kind of games that are played to get documents. And so, um, you know, that's kind of par for the course, but sometimes when there's smoke, there's fire. So right. when somebody's really trying to keep documents from you, then there's probably something in there that's going to um, help it. But what about with the pandemic and COVID-19? Have you seen anything kind of eke up or go down or new issues that you've had to deal with in any capacity? Not really. Um, I mean, I think, you know, situations like this or even in recessions, um, historically during recessions, I see more divorce, um, you know, because I think it just 
for people to maybe deal with things that they didn't deal with when, especially, and this is going to sound so superficial, but when money is just free flowing and everybody can do what they want, whenever those reins get tightened. And, you know, we see that in companies with embezzlements too. Typically we have more embezzlement cases that are discovered. They haven't started during the recession. They are discovered in a recession because you're pulling back those available funds. So um, nothing really different to me. I mean, divorce is still divorce, <laughs> even if it's a pandemic or not. Yeah. And unfortunately, uh, some of the stuff that you and I are encountering um, may not have a shelf life. So it may not have started when you got divorced. There could be, pe you know, like there's a lot of people that are just doing things not above board yeah. in general. And it's just been their MO for however long they've doing it. So it's not that, like they're trying to hide anything, um, but they definitely, and, and there are times when we're using some of this information to try to get a case settled. You know, yeah. like we find something and we're like, you don't want this to go to trial, do you? You know, and we're giving them uh, the benefit of the doubt that they can make a different decision and right. stop doing this. Right. <laughs> do, you, do you have any, like, what was one of your craziest cases where you found the hidden assets and it was just, I mean, you just told a, a different story, but do you have any other kind of crazy case that you could shed some light on? Yeah. So my, the, the case that I think is the craziest is actually related to understated income, uh, not necessarily something hidden. I'm trying to think if we, I think we might've found a few bank accounts. And so then that increased the balance sheet a little, but um, it was really an understated income because both spouses were successful, uh, had their own profession and they're both very successful and just kind of ran their thing. And then Somebody decided, one of them, I don't remember who, but one of them decided to file for divorce. And um, then each of them are trying to get the other's money. So, mm -hmm. no, I didn't do the best. You did. Right. And then right. You, know, you didn't. And so they're just trying to, like, you know, reach across and grab some out of the other's purse or something. Um, and so in that case, uh, my, uh, I was looking at, um, the spouse I was investigating had, I mean, kind of that serial entrepreneur, lots of management companies, different year ends, all of this stuff. And so, and so the valuation expert said that it was worth about $50,000, that this whole conglomerate was worth $50,000. So of course my client is saying there is no way like I know how we live. I know how he lives. I know how he spends. That is impossible. So I, uh, we ended up with about over three years, I believe. We had about $30 million of transfers between all of his bank accounts. And so that's not, that's just $30 million like being reused. Right. Right. But we had, um, or I guess about 10 million a year, but being reused, but um, I mean, it's just like going back and forth, going back and forth. And so what, I, so I teamed up with the valuation expert. Um, it was their lead. And so then I came in to help and I just said, what if we put everything on the same year end and we essentially do what I've talked about several times on this episode, we look at where did money come from and where did it go, but put it on the same year end so that it doesn't matter if it was deferred for tax purposes or whatever. Let's see how much money was really recognized in each year. And then let's pull out, uh, he wanted to, the valuation expert wanted to look at what was the uh, benefit to all of the owners. So once we identified all of these transfers, you know, because they had included some of them as revenue on certain, uh, and, and I can explain that. So with the different year ends, it would be recognized as revenue on one company and an expense on the other. But by having the different year ends, it wasn't being recognized in the same year. So when you put all of these companies together, some of it's just like this timing difference. Mm -hmm. So that's how they were getting such a low valuation, which for tax purposes, this was really beneficial going back to, this is why he set this up. But whenever it comes to separate, you know, divorcing and the value of this asset as part of the property settlement, that's a different story. So once we did all of that and the valuation expert did what he did with uh, the benefit to the owners, we ended up with a $1.5 million valuation and the judge uh, judge granted it. The judge agreed with our valuation. 
That is crazy. Well, and it is, it is a lot of um, shell games. I mean, I have clients that like, I'm going to make this company make money this year and this one's going to lose. And then we're going to switch it up, you know, cause we don't want the IRS to catch up with this, yep. you know, and, and realistically we are kind of fed that we should limit our taxes, like do not pay taxes. And the only way to do that is to lower your income by buying things or spending the money. Um, when in the reality is that there's value to that and it's just arbitrary spending sometimes, but, um, I can see how that could get confused or even, I mean, because you're going to get that same issue. If you're looking at, you can't compare bank statements from different years and right. want to get a whole picture. You have to get a whole picture so that, um, really from our end. So we're not over counting something. When you have $10 million moving back and forth, because I've had a couple clients that have done this and I, they're like, I think, I think they're actually making 30 million instead of 15 million. And I was like, well, it's actually going into the, the checking and then they're moving it into the savings and then they're moving it back into the checking and then it's going out, you know, like they have some weird cash flow management system that's <laughs> making it seem like you have deposits going into the savings and the checking, but they're the same ones. So a lot of times we're trying to make sure that we're getting the right picture, right? Yeah. Not getting confused because it's confusing information. Right. right. <laughs> and people don't always understand it. Um, well, what else should people know about how to get prepared? I know you talked earlier and maybe we'll just... Um, talk a little bit about it one more time. You know, there's financial information and documents that people should start collecting as they prepare to file for divorce. And we're going to provide a checklist that you've put together. We obviously have valuation checklists, but there is a reason to prepare for divorce, right? And have you seen well, you've already talked about one situation where you didn't prepare and you couldn't testify to you couldn't get the data. You know, if you're getting divorced, there's timing. Like you have to do discovery, you have to get subpoenas and things like that. But what kind of documents should they be just looking for, like around the house or in general? Um, what suggestions do you have if they're just they have an inkling that something might be wrong? Yeah, I mean, really the bank statements, any business bank statements, or if you can find any uh, like documents from Secretary of State or something that say that there's some sort of LLC and you don't recognize that name, um, uh, those are usually where to start. Credit cards, if you know that you you have a Chase card and he has a Chase card, or and then uh, you see one day there's an Amex and it doesn't have the company name on it, maybe that he works for, you know, just getting that information ahead of time and scanning it or taking photos of it uh, just so that you at least have one piece of something that can help with that discovery request, because there is only so much time to request information. I mean, you can try to extend discovery and things like that, but that's why getting organized at the beginning is so helpful. And if you have these little, well, I only have this one month. Well, if, if it's got the account number, we can get the rest through the attorney right. and discovery. We can get the rest. What's difficult is when we've already been through discovery, you hire somebody like us and then you're saying, well, I'm pretty sure there's another credit card. If it is not showing up in any of the information that we've gotten that day, me going like and writing a report and then maybe having to testify at a hearing to tell the judge why we need this information. And they're arguing, I mean, if you have proof of it, it is much easier to get that information. And especially if you can get it from the very beginning. Yeah. And I try to tell clients that, you know, the process isn't subpoena, you know, like formally requesting bank statements from every bank that exists, right? right. That that's crazy. Like, it, that's not how it works. You identify, we have bank accounts at, you know, uh, wherever Merrill Lynch or whatever. And then the attorney goes to Merrill Lynch and says, Hey, give me, you know, these certain number of statements that are in either party's name, but there's not some like official database, uh, you know, that you can just be like, Hey, 
plug in my social security and it's going to spit out a number like this is um and yes there's the dark web and yes there's other ways to get information but it's different tracing assets and looking for hidden assets is finding the nuance of the statements and the nuance of the details and really trying to like weave your way into it right and and looking for tiny little pieces of information kind of a lot of needles in a haystack um but i think that clients can start listening and they can start listening to what their spouse says they can start paying attention i've had them start writing down write down things that you don't think is important write down things that you think is important and all that in between so that you remember it and when you talk to me or your attorney when you tell them those things, it's going to trigger something different in our head than it's going to trigger in their head. Right. Um, and that gets us kind of, ooh, okay, let's look over here. Let's look over here yeah. <laughs> kind of thing. Well, and you've mentioned um, your company, Workman Forensics, and all the various services you provide. Um, should somebody start with this workbook because you have a workbook that can be downloaded? Like, is that a good starting point to working with you or should they just reach out to you and ask questions? Like what should they do next if they think that there are some hidden assets? Yeah, definitely. The workbook is super helpful just to start getting organized. And then uh, we're always happy to talk to anybody who just schedules an appointment with us on at workmanforensics.com or uh, specifically related to divorce, even find money in divorce.com. That's where you can find the workbook. It's all it's all workmanforensics.com is the hub of how to get in contact with us. But I have a wonderful case manager, our forensic accounting manager, who will set up a time to talk to you. I will say that typically, um, so if you don't have an attorney, the workbook is the best place to start. If you do have an attorney, workbook is still great, but really we can't do a whole lot to help you until you've, uh, you know, until a client has retained an attorney. Yeah, and uh, are you ever kind of helping people with the attorney or giving lists or things like that? Could they still reach out to you? Maybe you have attorneys that understand your process um, yeah. that could be referrals and things like that. So, yeah. so even if they haven't filed, they could still reach out to you just to kind of get an understanding of how to get started. Absolutely. It's just sometimes we get those phone calls where they say, I've got all this information, like, can we get started? And the best way is really to do the workbook on those types of situations and then find, you know, help them find an attorney. But before we really jump in, we need that attorney to be involved so that we can have the discovery process on our side and subpoena, you know, the attorney can subpoena what we need. Uh, that's when the ball really gets rolling. That's awesome. Well, you've given some really good information today. And Leah, you also have a podcast, right? So you're an expert at this as well. What is the pod, the name of the podcast uh, website or anything? Yeah. So um, it's also at workmanforensics.com, but it's called the, the Investigation Game Podcast. And uh, we talk about all things investigation, like even murder, public corruption, forensic accounting cases, fraud cases. If it has, if it is any type of investigation, uh, we, we, uh, I actually had the opportunity to interview John Kerry who was the investigative reporter for the Theranos scandal. And so wrote the book, Bad Blood. So if it's an investigative reporter, just anything investigations, that's, Oh, and, and I watch some of the podcasts and it's just kind of into, like, we all just as voyeurs just love to hear this information, right? We so do. it's, it, your, your podcast is actually entertaining as well as informative. So we, we appreciate you um, being a guest here. And if you have kind of questions, um, reach out to you or us and we'll connect you to the right people. So thanks, Leah. Thank you so much for having me, Melissa. Yeah, you're welcome.